it is nice to have a, time, a period of time that's carved out that I, I can plan around Wednesday night church, you know, whether it's school business or other business that, that I can get off that merry-go-round for a little bit and come in here with you guys and uh, we can study the word and uh, help ourselves put things back in perspective a little bit. And, uh, and I think one of the things that people miss when they forsake the assembly but, it's, but I, I, and I'm using that expression to really talk a lot about Wednesday night. Midweek service is helpful to me. I think it's helpful to a lot of people to clear the mechanism, to get, get out of the world, get out of the rat race, so to speak, and uh, get where, uh, to a point and to a place that you're, you're reminded of what's really important to you. You know, uh, I'm, I'm, right now I'm teaching Texas history and I'm coaching track and got these things are so important. You know, we, I, we had a track meet last night. I got home, I sat down to eat supper last night. I think it was right at midnight. Got to bed at one, alarm went off at 5.30 for go back at it this morning, you know, and we just had such a late night last night, but it was so intense. You're trying to accomplish, you're trying to do, you're trying to do, you're trying to do. And then sometimes you, we really need that moment to just take a step back, take a deep breath and realize, Mm, you know, that mile relay is kind of important, but on the grand scale of things, how that kid high jumps is, it's okay. I mean, it's good, it's important, but on the grand scheme of things, it's, it's right up there with uh, the price of coffee, you know? I mean, it's, I'd like, to, like it to be this. And anyway, I think we need it because we really get into whatever it is, our work or our home or, you know, the the house needs cleaning or the grass needs mowing or whatever it is. There's things that, you know, you just get so caught up in. You need that moment of time that's carved out, chiseled out, a moment to step off the merry-go-round and center our thoughts. So that's one thing I really do appreciate about teaching this Wednesday night class, but also just being a part of it as well. As you can tell, we're in belief. And we'll, uh, we'll be there in a minute. I want to, I'm going to start in Hebrews chapter 11 if you want to, head in that general direction. And as we turn to Hebrews 11, I want to uh, want to talk to you about this for just a second, kind of as a thought-provoking lead-off question for you. Have you ever known someone that liked to lie? Clinton Barrett grew up with a boy. I won't give you his name because some of you know him. He's one of her coach's sons. And uh, that boy, I think, would rather tell a lie than tell the truth when it didn't even matter. When it was some, it had zero relevance, and he'd just lie to you. And you made you kind of scratch your head like, why would you lie about that? We know kind of the truth, and it's preferable for some people to lie. Have you known anybody like that? Or they lied so often you doubted what they told you. Um, you know, and one of my pet peeves, this, uh, this is a pet peeve of mine. People do it all the time. Adults do this, not kids even. That's, uh, they'll, say this, you, they'll use this expression. And, it, and the younger people do it as well too. But they'll say, I ain't going to lie to you, but tomorrow we're doing this. And I, I know they're just emphasizing. But I, I do not like the expression. Because they're implying, they're saying, I would sometimes lie to you, but right now I'm not lying to you. And so the truth matters. The, and your perception of that matters. I, I start off with that because it, tonight the topic is belief. And where I'm going with this, as part of my introduction, is if you believe something, your actions will follow it. I mean, don't you just, one of the things I get frustrated with the most is people that say this and their actions betray them. They're, they believe this. You know, they'll tell you this, but then you see them and you go, in, in your mind you think, you don't even believe that. You don't believe it yourself. I can tell. Or the role none of us want to play, we've all, we've all been guilty of it at some point in our life, I'm sure, and that is the role of the hypocrite. You know, I preach this, I say this, but I do this. You know, and that's something I think we as Christians should work to avoid. One thing I don't want to do is be false or misleading or 
paint a picture that ain't so. You know, I, I think as Christians, one of our goals ought to be truth and honesty, ought to be a big part of everything we do. And um, what about the idea of preaching this? You know, that, uh, isn't there a quote? I would rather see a sermon than hear one preached any day. You know, the mentality of your lifetime is the sermon. Your spans of weeks and months and days and years is the sermon, not what you said, not what you say. You know, I coach kids. I teach kids every day. I, I come in contact with 100 kids every day, uh, mostly 12-year-olds. And uh, Dan can relate to this. Dan, that's about the age you teach, isn't it? And, um, you know, you come in contact with, with that many kids, you will be told so many things and, and uh, half-truths, whatever. And... Um, as a, as a leader of these kids, dealing with these kids, one thing that's really important to me is my words are truth, as best I got. Will I make a mistake? I'm not gonna lie to you. Can I be wrong? I absolutely can, but truth is truth, and you will know what I believe, not just because of what I say, but what I do. And that's the point I really wanna emphasize, that's the first nail I wanna put in all this, is we're going to talk about belief, but sometimes people's beliefs, they, they characterize it with their words and their actions do not follow up very well. And don't you hate that? And in, and in despising that, that concept, don't you try to, or shouldn't we try for that not to be a descriptor of you or me? You know, I, I hope my actions speak louder than whatever words I tell kids or adults or anything else. That's what I hope. And that's really what I, I wanted to use as kind of a launching boy, board for tonight. I, I want to talk about belief and how it's important in, in terms of the gospel and the plan of salvation. But what really is it? We, I mean, we all know what we believe. We know what belief means. I can define it and we can look at it. We're going to look at several verses, as you know me, that's what kind of that's my mantra. I like looking at a lot of different verses and make, make some points along the way with it. But I want to focus on belief tonight. If you would, I'm going to ask Glenn, would you mind wording a prayer and kind of kick us off and let's get into this. If you're in Hebrews chapter 11, the verse I want to pull out is 6. <laughs> Hebrews 11 and 6. Hebrews 11 verse 6 where it says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe. Now the link I'm trying to make here is the linkage between faith and belief. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You know, this, the, uh, the word belief is used here. It's linked to faith, and it's also linked to, to um, salvation reward, by saying the rewarder of those who seek him. And the couple of points here, I linked it to faith, but really what I want to link it to also is the word seek. And uh, the fact that belief is not a, a thought, it's not word, it is action. It is, the, uh, the seeking is part of that belief. I started all this when I was talking about people lie or people tell you the truth or people tell you what they believe. And, and it's going in this direction, and then their actions go in a totally different direction. And isn't it disappointing when you see that? When you see someone who's a, a strong Christian background, and all of a sudden they about face and go in a totally different direction. And it makes you wonder, it, was your belief 
that week. And, you know, and now, now I'm putting a question to you and me too. You know, when we look ourselves in the mirror, are our beliefs that weak? When, we, when you fall, when, when I fall, when I, when I step in it, when I, when I make a bad decision or I leave something totally undone, um, is my belief really that weak that I can't be faithful and can't live the life that I professed that I said I was? Am I really that weak? And so um, I, the word belief in this concept is profound. Now, I used Hebrews 11, but I want to look at all these. Now, John 3, 16, um, I brought this up a week or so ago. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And um, I'm going to read it, Donnie. Jesus wept, Donnie. I remember that one from last week. Uh, here, let me go here. Where it's um, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But then grab verse 18 with it. Where it says, um, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, let me pause and kind of put this in perspective for a moment. When we hear, when we talk, when members of the church talk about the plan of salvation, we really like to go down the road of hear, believe, repent confess. We kind of got it memorized and, and I'm not, I'm not uh, disputing that or saying anything negative about that. Any tools that help us keep things kind of organized and straight is a, a good tool, a good thing. And, but notice the order is kind of important. You know, you, you can't believe if you don't hear and you can't hear without a preacher as Romans says. And so um, it is, the, the order of it is important. And condemnation is mentioned in verse 18, and, uh, and it says he's condemned already. The condemned already part I reference in my head at least, um, the, the, the connection between the belief, the ascension, the mental ascent, and the actions. A um, couple more. Go to uh, John chapter 8. Let me get my, my notes kind of equal, even with where I am on the board. John 8, verse 24. Six, seven. And he said to them, You are from beneath I am from above that's verse 23 therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins for if you do not believe that I am he you will die in your sins alright here's the point I want to emphasize now this is the peg I want to nail to the wall and that is what are we supposed to believe and where I'm going with this and I'm going to spend I'm, I'm going to come back to this again later but the point, what are we supposed to believe? And the, the belief is going to be tied to the confession. We, we must believe in Jesus Christ. We must believe in his word, in his teachings, and in his life, and in his death, and in his sacrifice. Which goes back to where we started this study, the gospel. Which goes back to where we really started the study, which is the kingdom, which is where he was preaching when he, when he came. He was preaching the kingdom. He was preaching the gospel. And the belief of this is the belief in Jesus and who he is and all the things about him and the truths that are about him. Now, when I, often when I think of these things, especially in an audience like this, I want to focus on teaching other folks. You know, you, at some point you're going to come across Cross someone who has differences of opinion religiously and you would like to go down this road with them and belief you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God you have to believe in his teachings and so forth 
And that's going to align right up with the confession. And we'll get more into that uh, with, in terms of the confession later. And then John 11, I, we read a little bit of John 11 earlier. We read verse 6. Let's go to 26. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. You believe this. She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, that the Son, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Now, that is the backbone of what we are, when belief is being talked about, what this is. All right, now I want to revert back to where we started for just a second. If I believe something, first of all, I froze last night at a track meet, all right? It was cold. You know what I believed? I believed it was going to be cool, so I grabbed a lightweight jacket and took it to the track meet. And the whole time I had a lightweight jacket on, and the wind was going about 25 miles an hour, and it was about 48 degrees, and I froze. I believed, and my action was this. And if you believe something, your actions follow suit. And if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and you really believe that, you believe that wholeheartedly, do you? Think about it for your sake, you know, put yourself in the mirror for just a moment. Do you really believe that? How about some of the people that aren't here? Do they really believe that? And do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? And if you really believe that, do your actions match it? For example, how, how important is your faith really? If you really believe that, is your faith the dominant thing in your life? I mean, you know, if you put your faith and your religious thoughts way on the back burner, hey, you're busy. You're trying to make a living. You got this going on. You got family issues. You got, you got all these things. But if you really believe Jesus Christ, the Son of God, wouldn't your perspective be a little better? And I'm indicting you, and I'm indicting Tracy Blankenship. Sometimes I think we, we let the world create the confusion for us, and we put the things that are really important to us back there. I had a college professor, Dr. Browning. I, I still remember what Dr. Browning said. Coach Crossley, you remember, Mr. Crossley, you remember Dr. Browning? He was the uh, Legion Field superintendent. He had a lot of wise remarks. He was kind of a funny character. But he, he was the guy, in one of his quotes, he didn't originate the quote, but he used it all the time. And he said, now class, and he was talking about education, don't sweat the small stuff. And then he'd pause, and he'd say, as you know, it's all small stuff. And he'd be talking something real intense, real important, and then he would try to put perspective back to it. And I think that's a great lesson as a Christian. Christians. Don't sweat the small stuff. And you know what? It's, that track meet last night, other than me freezing, that was all small stuff. And, I, and I've used that as an example of the things I deal with, the headaches I got, the kids that are acting like a knucklehead. This one's got a, a parent problem and a sibling problem. And, you know, this one I had to get on to, and she broke her heart, and I tried to mend a fence, and she's upset with me. And, you know, you have all these problems and all these issues. And I think of Dr. Browning, don't sweat the small stuff. That small stuff, it gets, it's what you deal with, it's the fight you go when you leave the, this room. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And I want to go back to that, and I want to go back to it, and I want to go back to it again and remind you, if you really believe that, your actions will show that. I believe that with a, everything I got, Brother Mike. Yes. Your beliefs will be your undoing, and they will be your, to your huge benefit. Well, that is a lesson in my seventh graders that I am really trying to teach. You know, the accountability thoughts of, you know, it's decisions yours to make or not make. And anyway, I'm, you're going to hear me harp on this, but 
If you really believe something, your actions follow it. Belief is not mental assent. It's not mental check, I got you. It's not raising of your hand. There's a little more to it than that. Turn to page John 12. <clears throat> 46. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. If you believe in Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then your life will follow that. And it shows in your habits. Have you ever been a slave to a habit where you had a bad habit? This was really, you know, this ran my show for a long time. And, you know, and, and it controlled me. And at some point you get to that point of, I refuse to let this control me anymore. I'm not going to do that. That's not that important. And habits are, to me, bad habits particularly are good examples because we've dealt with them. Uh, to help the perspective of what we're talking about here, if I believe, my actions will show it. And I can handle putting away a habit or putting something I'm passionate about into its proper category and maybe put it in the trash can so that what I really believe I will do. If I am absolutely convinced it's going to rain tomorrow, I'm bringing my frog togs to work. I will do that. My belief and my actions match up. Don't be, Tracy, you, don't be the person, your belief of what you say and, and your actions don't line up. And that's a big point, I'm, as you know, I'm trying to make tonight. Um, let's spend a... We're in John. Let's go, let's finish out John. There's a couple of more verses in John I'd like for you to look at with me. Um, go to John 20. And really this might be the last one in John. I've got several of these. I just want to pull out a thought or two with you. John 20, I'm at 20, verse 29 and 30. John 20, 29 says, Jesus said to him, Thomas, now did I skip one? Yeah, we're good. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. When you talk about this subject of belief, that's a great story. The story of doubting Thomas is a story this audience would be pretty familiar with. You know, that he really wanted to touch Jesus aside before he knew for sure. How many of you would be in that situation there? You know, I, I, I have empathy for Thomas. You know, what to think? What has just happened here? I am confused. You know, that mentality of what? What just happened? You know, what role? And you're just bumfuzzled. So I have empathy for Thomas. But when he says, you know, good for you, Thomas. How great that is. Congratulations. D golf clap for you. But what about all the people that hasn't seen me? What about these millions of people that's going to come along later and they don't have the benefit of touching my side that you have? And, and now I want to compliment you. And I say you, I mean everyone who, who tries to wear the name Christian is we're the one he's referencing. We're, we didn't have the luxury of touching his side. All we had was the book. And hopefully someone, a, a spouse or a, a mother-in-law, a, someone who taught us, who, who laid the example for us, who we could see and say, that's kind of how I want to be. And so, anyway, I just wanted to, the story of Thomas is a great lesson on belief, and Jesus compliments those that will come after that believe that didn't, that weren't witnesses to this. All they have, all that you have, all that I have, is the book. Am I oversimplifying it? What am I leaving off? I, I mean that. I, I don't mean to. 
You know, I know we have preachers. We have examples. But mainly, our, we have the word of the Creator set aside for us. A couple more. Stay with me. All right, let's go to Romans. Romans is a g good book on salvation, but it's not the only book on salvation. What, uh, what Romans has to say in chapter 10 and other places is good, but it's not uh, everything when it comes to salvation or the plan of salvation. Romans 10. A lot of people love Romans 10 in the religious world. Let's keep it in perspective. Chapter, uh, chapter 10, verse 14 of Romans. Oh, I'm in 9. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So this, um, Romans 14, how are they going to call on him if we're to call on the name of the Lord? And how can we call on someone we don't believe in? And how do we believe in someone that we don't know? Now, let me see if I'm uh, getting too far out in front of you. I'm kind of off my track here. It's, what's bad is when you do this on Sunday and you're teaching on it on Wednesday, it, sometimes the, the planets don't line up, but that's okay. Anyway, um, Romans 10, and also Romans 10 is there, and I probably should have began with that, verses 9, where it says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The point I want to make here is this, per, uh, the, the pecking order, the, you believe before you can do other things. You have to have something to believe in, but until you believe, you're not going to do anything else. A lot of people think Romans stands alone in terms of salvation, but it's only a, a, a small window of the, of the process. You do have to believe. And remember who's the audience in Romans. It's the, it's, uh, the Israelites. Uh, I think it's chapter 6, or maybe in the first part of chapter 10, they're even there, that it mentions them specifically. Y'all's problem is, y'all don't even believe. And until you believe, it doesn't, rest of this really don't matter. You know, when you teach someone, you got to kind of meet them at their level a little bit. You got to, you know, reach to them and uh, where are they? Uh, someone who knows very little about Christianity, you probably not the time to start talking about. Um, Falling from grace, or, or um, uh, you know, more complicated thought issues, um, uh, Thessalonians, and where the end of time, and so forth. They may take you there, but you need to take baby steps. And belief is definitely a baby step to get people started. With the heart, one believes. Belief is your inner being. I remember, believe it or not, I remember the first lesson Tyler Sams preached. It stuck out with me. And I don't remember the whole lesson. I just remember a point he made. And, and I believe it was that time he was headed to Nacogdoches to start the whole journey of, of, of preaching. And he talked about the inner you. You know, there's you that everybody sees. There's you that maybe your spouse or someone really inside your circle sees, and then there's the most inner core of you. He made some kind of reference to that, and I, I think that's, that reference has stuck with me, especially when you make the application like here of belief. With your heart, one believes. With your heart, your most inner being, you must, you got to believe. And then... Um, I'm going to reference Mark 16. I'm not, we don't have to turn there because you remember Mark 16, 15, and 16, the Great Commission. When Jesus tells the apostles, go into all the world and preach the gospel, 
he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Now I want to connect, make the connection for just a second between belief and baptism. And only from the standpoint that, that I really want to emphasize is that I want to do it this way. The reference I made earlier about if I believe something, I mean I believe it, my actions follow. It's natural. I'll carry the umbrella because I think it's, I know it's going to rain. Or you're in East Texas, you take an umbrella and sunscreen and sunshades. You know, you take it all because of here. Of here. But um, you, hang on, I lost my thought. I shouldn't have brought up the umbrella and the sunscreen, sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, I was pointing out the Great Commission and how they, Jesus told them to believe and be baptized. And I was making the connection between baptism and um, belief. That your actions are naturally going to follow. So therefore it's not always necessary for, for the tag of baptism to be attached to the word belief every time it's mentioned. If you believe something, your actions follow suit naturally. If you actually believe something is absolute, it's going to happen. If I'm absolutely convinced that East Texas Professional Credit Union is going to go broke Friday, you know what I'm doing tomorrow? I need to withdraw my, you know, everything I got. I, I would take it if I, if I knew it. If I, deep in my heart, that's going to happen. I'm, my actions will follow my belief. I'm not going to go to the coffee shop and say, y'all taking y'all's money out? I'm thinking about it. What are you going to do? You know, I w I'm not going to just talk about it. I'm not going to think about it. My, if I believe it, there's action. If you believe, as in the Great Commission, Mark chapter 16, 15, 16, uh, he that believeth and is baptized will be saved. If you, be, if you believe what the scripture says, the actions will naturally follow. It, and it's not, that's not a grasp, it's not a reach, it's not anything extravagant. All right, a few more. The, my best illustrations on, uh, on belief, well really one I want to make, and that is a, a couple. John chapter 14, and we may have been there a while ago, but uh, I mean... John 14, 12, and 12, 13, and 14. John 14, where it says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Now this is the point I really want to emphasize. I think this is a really good verse summing it up. And I, I want to start over. I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father, and, who, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. But I wanted to emphasize, he will do. If you believe, you will do. And then James chapter 2, I'll reference these quickly. In James chapter 2, verse 19, that's one of the warnings, there's a couple of these where demons believed and shuddered. You know, the mental belief in something ain't enough. If, you're, if, if I believe the credit union may go broke Friday, I may or may not take my money out. You know, mental is not enough. If I, if I did not put action into, it, into something, did I really believe. Belief and action are connected. James chapter 2 is all about that. and We, we could spend a whole other uh, lesson on James chapter 2. Um, let's see what else I have. Uh, I may do that next week. I mentioned Hebrews 14 and uh, I mean Hebrews 11 and John 14. Um, and I mentioned James 2. Let's, go, let's uh, go to John chapter 1. Excuse me. 1 John chapter 4 verse 1. Let's look at that one. 1 John. Hebrews. James. Peter. 1 John 4. 
the first verse. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, let's talk about this for just a second. Let's make this plug about belief. What you believe matters. In other words, you got to believe the truth. Whatever the truth is, is what you really need to believe. Are you gullible? Have you know, ever known someone who is naive and gullible? In fact, the kids I teach, especially some of these girls, if I said they were naive, I would be paying them a compliment. It's sweet when I see someone that's naive and gullible. But we're not to be that so naive and so gullible that we, we will believe everything. Don't believe everything. Don't believe everything a preacher says. Don't believe everything a preacher that you trust says. It still matters that it aligns with the scripture. It still matters that you could, can make the conviction that it's your conviction. You know, your conscience needs to support everything. And so what you believe, it, it has to focus on truth. Truth it, it must be the focal point on your belief. You know, I use the expression, I think two or three times now, you know, if you can convince me that God wants me to do this, that's exactly what I will do. If you can show me I'm doing it wrong and he really, here's the scripture, Tracy, you're doing it wrong, you got to do it this way, I'll do it. If it makes me look silly or dumb. But what I don't want to do, I believe this way this week and six months from now I believe this way because I have changed my, are you at least open-minded enough to have, cha have you changed your opinion about maybe some scripture in the last year or five years or so forth? Have you come to the conclusion, go, you know what, I think I changed my mind about that. I can remember changing my mind about a few things. Uh, and, and even, in, even in scripture, um, you know, that I think it really means a little more this or, or that. I've, I've had my opinion change. I remember being young, thinking about you, college age. And I remember in college, uh, b there was a big debate, presidential election, and abortion was the issue. And I remember being empathetic about ab abortion for rape and incest situation. And I, I had, but my approach at that point in my life was, I could, I see that. And then this guy, I heard him speak, and he said the most profound thing. And I had one of those moments. I went, huh. And, he, and his comment was, was it that baby's fault that his mother was raped? Is it the baby's fault? How are you going to put it? And I thought, Ooh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. He's right. That was one of those. I use that as an example of a time when I changed my opinion about something. Have you ever had one of those in terms of your faith or something really dear to you or important to you? Hopefully not too many because one thing we don't want to be is tumbleweeds. The wind blowing this way, we all kind of do it this way. The wind's blowing this way, we're all kind of, you know, we would like to think we're the, we built our house on the rock. We're not building our house on the sand. We're not, we're not subject to the latest and someone else and someone new because the truth don't change. You might, there was a time I hated onions and tomatoes. I kind of like them now. You know, what I... I change. You're going to change, and I hope that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's important to be open-minded, but I also think we need to be grounded in truth, and that's what we believe in, and that's what we're hanging our hat on. All right. They're telling me to be quiet, Blankship. Well...